little minisphere, these bubbles, conservative bubbles, progressive bubbles. Everyone's always ranting and raving about freedom. They're always ranting and raving about how like I'm in control of my life and yet you're still stressing about who pays for dinner. How can you tell me you are thoughtful, in charge, and alpha, and you're still paranoid about who pays for dinner? Make it make sense. A man will say, you know, I want a woman who has her own life. I want somebody who is doing something in the world that is important to her, but I don't want her to make more money than me. It seems silly to me. Am I the only one who just think, thinks that's stupid? You know, like, wouldn't you be supportive if, you're, if, if your partner is making more? The only reason I could fathom, the only reason, is that they're afraid their partner is going to leave them because all of a sudden they don't feel needed anymore. All of a sudden their partner's getting all the attention and all the praise and this and that, and all of a sudden now you feel insignificant next to them and, you, and then you get very insecure and worried that they're mm -hmm. gonna leave you. And then therefore you're just like, no, you're not gonna do it. No, 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 and maybe you self-sabotage, you know? So I'm just saying, I, I, to me that doesn't seem quite healthy. So I could say. Right away, Graham is saying, why would you hate on your partner for making more than you? And it's interesting because one time I was hanging out with a group of friends and it was like more of a, I would say like liberal progressive couple. I would say more liberal couple. And in front of the group, I asked like, oh, who makes more money, you or her? And the guy was like really offended. He's like, what? I make more money. I was like, well, I don't know. I'm just asking. And then the guy friends were like, damn, way to like, way to like shatter his ego. And I was like, I... I don't know. They could both. I don't know. I'm just asking like, but it was like, I was kind of surprised that for such a liberal person, they took such offense at like the idea that they were making less than their female partner. And that's what I think will always be so ironic to me is like, you'll hear these people that say they're progressive or say that they're popping bubbles or say that they're sort of like in control of their life, but then they freak out at the idea and even their homies reinforce it sort of a ew, you don't make as much as your female partner? And it's like, what is this? I remember I dated a man and I've always made more money than my partners, male partners. My female partners have always made more money than me. Or rather, they've always made equal or more money than me. So that's kind of interesting. But the male partners I've dated, um, they always made less money than me. And I remember one partner saying, you're never gonna respect me unless I make more money than you. And I thought like, that is the weirdest thing you've ever said to me when I'm never, I've never been this stereotype. I've never been this person. That is not the categorization of who I am as a person. I've never cared how much my partner's made. I don't even care if my partner works. I've always just cared if my partner is gonna be a team player. And now in my relationship where I'm married and very much in love, like we're so happy every day. It feels like we like high five each other because we're like, yes. Like we're doing it. The team is doing it, you know? He doesn't work and I work full time and he does everything else. That's how I always say it. I work, he does everything else. And I know that sounds crazy because like what could that mean? It could mean so much when you're running a team who's really trying to hit some major goals. Like as a team, we're trying to really think about retirement, housing, all of these things. And we're aiming for some pretty big goals. So all I do is work and all he does is everything else. And it's already shown like in the last six months, I have made more money, gotten more subscribers, gotten more likes on my live streams. Guys, please like the live streams. It really makes a difference, okay? And all of this because all I have to do is work. Well, all he has to do is everything else. So I know for other people, they're like, both people should be working. We are both working. We're working to make the team win. Well, everybody else seems stressed and seems to be exhausted from their life. Their marriages are dwindling. They are way overworked. We are choosing to do a completely different method that is gonna make this team succeed. While everybody else is judging it and complaining about their lives, we are literally so happy, so joyful. It is literally perfect for us, but it's only because it works for us. We're only doing what works for us. We're not doing what works for you. You shouldn't do what works for us if it doesn't work for you. But it's this idea that all of these people brag about being in charge of their life, being alphas, I'm in control, and you're still stressed about who's paying for dinner. You're stressed about what it looks like to have a partner who stays home. Because again, you're imagining some partner that doesn't do anything all day because you married a bum. And that's true. When I was with my former partners, I was like, you don't have to make money. You just can't be a bum. And my partners wanted to not make money and be bums. 
So when I was aiming for like bigger goals, I was confused when they wouldn't join me in the progress because buying a house is not easy. So I can't have a I can't have a partner who doesn't understand like, hey, buying this house is not just a dream. I don't want to just talk about it. I want to do it. Right. I want to do this thing. Neve says, why is he never on camera with you? He is not a public figure. Fun fact, my husband is an on offline husband. Yeah, he's not a public figure at all. Does not have social media. Um, is a very private person. We love him. We love that about him. We love that he's strong about his boundaries. And it's true. We could make some more money doing couple stuff because people love couple stuff. But the money isn't worth breaking his consent or boundaries. Obviously, I always do what's good for the team. And that includes mental health. Doing what's good for the team is also mental health, right? Say I'm raising a boy who is now 18 years old. And even things like, you know, does he still pay? He always wants to pay on a date. So it's like, if he pays, mm -hmm. then some people take offense. If he doesn't pay, then some people take offense. And he just doesn't know what to do. You do what you want to do. Daddy Graham just said it. You do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. The best part of adulting, guys, is you get to dress how you want, spend your money how you want, live how you want. Yes, there are outside resources. So the existing part, you get to do whatever you want. The relationship you have with existence, everything outside of yourself, a little bit more challenging. But for the most part, you really can do whatever you want. That's the point, right? You do whatever you want. I don't get how this is such a crazy take. If if you want to pay, pay. If you don't want to pay, don't pay. If you want to pay, and I feel like Graham is so over this conversation. He's like so over it, and I think like a lot of us are. But I think I need to always keep saying it in my work because there's always people that are so shocked. Like you can do whatever you want. They're like, I can. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. Who would have thunk? Who would have thunk you could do whatever you want? That creates an issue. That person's not for you. If you don't pay and that creates an issue, that person's not for you. I think when it, when it comes to like, you know, the talk of like, oh, being a man, I think a lot of that is doing what you feel is right. You know, mm -hmm. and again, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, right? let's let's throw that out there. It's not hurting anybody, but it's it's having the confidence and the self assurance to be able to rely on yourself and to be able to take action towards what you feel is best, mm. even if it ruffles some feathers. Can you imagine? And we're gonna get into it about the eighteen thousand dollar Alpha Boot Camp. Can you imagine? You're sitting here spending. 18k on a boot camp for three days we'll get into it and you're stressing about who's paying for dinner it's like girl just pay the fucking bill don't pay the bill do whatever you want can you imagine saying i'm completely in charge of my life no one's going to tell me what to do fuck the matrix and you can't even figure out paying for dinner ma'am now, I am a woman who t tends to pay for dinner, but I'm also a Middle Eastern woman who is taught to pay for dinner in the sense that if you go out with friends and gender isn't playing a role, you pay for dinner, but also pay attention to who doesn't pay for dinner. Pay attention to generosity. Pay attention to, you know, who like, you know, growing up, growing up Middle Eastern, I used to watch my dad fight for the bill for like 20 minutes with people. That's literally just expect it. Expect 20 minutes of your dinner time is people fighting over the bill, Right. But could you imagine living in a bubble where you're like, I'm in charge of my whole life. I I, I know exactly the secrets of the universe. Oh, shit. <laughs> who pays? Who pays? Oh, my God. Who pays for the Starbucks? It's like, bro. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody, th that's what you need to do. So I think a lot really just comes down to, to confidence and not being stifled in your actions and not feeling like you mm -hmm. have to hold back and not having to feel like, you know, you have to watch what you say and all this sort of stuff. If you can get over that, just be yourself and just own it. That's what I think is really important. Not so much the who pays, who doesn't pay. Personally, I tend to think that, listen, if, if you never want to date the person again, split it, you know? Or if you really see a lot of potential, just pay, just pay. I just talked about it before the date. 
or it depends. Like I remember one of my partners, I really wanted to go to this really fancy restaurant and I knew I made money and he didn't have a job because um, his girlfriend paid for everything because they were in a polyamorous relationship. So I was like, I'll take you out, but I want to go to this restaurant. So I'll pay the bill. And it was like $400 worth it. Amazing restaurant. It's called the Pink Door in Seattle. Such a vibe. The owner came and gave us drinks. We showed up early for our reservation. She was so nice to us. Like, totally what a vibe. Great. One of the greatest dinner experiences I've ever had. And I don't care about paying because, like, I'm doing it for me ultimately. But in the long run, and even now, like, I never mind paying. It just never, ever crosses my mind to care about paying for things. What crosses my mind is whether or not people are grateful, whether or not it's like they get snobby about it and spoiled, whether or not they just assume it should be that way. Look, when my in-laws take us out for lunch, we tend to go every like month, they refuse to let me pay. Do I offer every time? Yes, because it's like the proper thing to do. Do they let me pay? No, because like they're the parents and they feel like, why are you paying? Same thing when I go out with my parents. I obviously am like, can I get this? And sometimes my parents are like, okay, sure. And I'm like, cool. But other times, obviously my parents are going to pay. Obviously, because I have grown up parents. And it's kind of that sign of like, who's the grown up? But also, who has the more money? What's the generosity here? Sometimes I pay for my friends. My friends pay for me. Like it just, all of this is about the goodness of you not showing some fake presentation of I have money. This is about you and how you show love and affection and then how you are grateful for people making an effort for you. And I think this idea is so interesting. Now, Abba and Preach also reviewed this particular video and something that stood out to me was like Abba was talking about generosity and how he tends to be. And when we were in Miami, um, I did feel that. Like we, you know, we paid for different things while we were in Miami, but he paid a much larger bill than I did. He paid for the Airbnb. And he didn't ask me to participate in paying for it. Now, I, you know, I got a couple things here and there, but barely like it, a couple Uber rides, but it didn't match up. I paid for dinner once, but it didn't match up to, you know, what he paid for. And I just appreciated that so much. And it spoke so highly of him to me, which I, I, I'm not surprised, but also, you know, you never know. And people were really good when I went to Miami in particular. I noticed like Destiny paid for things, which was really lovely. Abba paid for things. I paid for things. Like we, we really showed up. It's interesting, like how you're taught in different bubbles to put for that good foot forward, to be, you know what I mean? It's like a generosity thing, but it's also just like, it says something about you. Now, of course, it's not to mean something bad about people who can't pay, but I'll tell you this. I had a friend once who would come to like breakfast brunch with us and basically drink alcohol and then wait for us to finish eating and whoever had leftovers would ask if she could eat their leftovers. And eventually, because I would buy meals that I had a, I had leftovers for so I could have a meal later in that day, I'd be like, hey, you can't eat my leftovers. And she's like, oh. And I was like, yeah, I don't – like if you want to eat food, you need to buy food and not alcohol. But she had an alcoholic problem. So it was like we didn't realize it at the time, but now it makes more sense. And eventually I had to put down my foot and say, I'm buying this food so I can have lunch later. So I'm getting two meals out of one. That's how I buy food. And so we had to have that conversation. But people did like almost feel bad for her and they weren't sure what to do. But like it was not like any of us were running with – it's not like any of us had a lot of money in our early 20s. So a part of me felt like she was kind of being brewed by taking advantage of people who also barely had the money. You know what I mean in some aspects? And so I think it says a lot about you, like if you're willing to take advantage of people slash are you willing to be generous as well? You know what I mean? So this whole like who should pay on the first date, I think a generous person pays. And I think if you assume somebody else should pay, that might be a more of a reflection than you, of you than you think it is. Pay for the first date, I think that's totally fine. Or third option, okay? You get the meal, she gets the desserts. There you go, because the meal might be like 50 bucks, dessert, you know, 10. That way, you know what, both both people get to throw something in there. She could say I'm doing something. The guy says, well, I got dinner. I think that's totally fine. You know, I think a lot of people would say, oh, well, it means like, you know, that. Even as siblings, I'll say as siblings, the so I'll be like, hey, come come get like Starbucks with me or something. Some, let's come get Jabba with me. So, I don't know, something. And my sibling would be like, I don't want to leave the house. I'm like, I'll pay for you. And they're like, I'm coming. 
it's like, yeah, like sometimes you just like even to get out of the house, you're like, I'll buy you like in and out if you come with me. They're like, I'm coming. You know what I mean? It's like free food. I'm coming. It's like that's also like a way that people just I don't know. It's just like a thing you do that you expect something back from me. You expect, you know, that, that we're going to have sex or you expect, you know, whatever these Control old ideas me. are. Gosh, that's the worst take possible. No, no. If you pay. Listen, OK. <laughs> Can't believe we even have to have these discussions. If, if you go and invite someone on a date and they say yes mm -hmm. and you decide to pay, mm -hmm. that's it. The, 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 that event is done. So we just log that off, delete that. There's no. Yes, but if you're in a hookup bubble culture, if you're in hookup culture, it's a little bit different of a bubble. So if the date is a, a, the precursor to the sex, then the date is sort of the foreplay into the sex, which is sort of ironic because like I always like to have sex before eating, not after. But in the hookup culture bubble, usually you do go out to dinner and then you go back to their place for sex. But in the dating bubble, I actually think I agree with Graham, where if you're in the serious dating bubble, if this is a serious date, then you obviously should assume no sex after the first date. Because there's so much more that has to happen before that, like STI testing and condoms and birth control conversations. But that's not what's usually happening in the world, right? Lexi says the moral is that everyone needs to be more autistic and ignore so societal norms and do what you want. Some women like men when uh, pay or like when men pay, some women are offended by it. Find someone who aligns with you, bro. Literally. Literally, right? It's just so interesting. Alex says some some there are some freaks that think paying for your meal equals entitlement to sex. Well, I think entitlement goes both ways. The entitlement that the man will pay and the entitlement that the woman will give you sex. I dislike both of them. No expectation for anything after that. It's not like, oh, I paid you owe me. No, it's just like. You got together for the date. The date was your idea. She obliged. That That's it. So it's just like expecting going on a date and be like, well, she went on a date. I spent all my money. Blah, blah, blah. No, come on. Th th then it just becomes a transaction. You know, you don't want a relationship like a transaction like that. It's just a terrible, terrible idea. You go on a first date with a guy and he asks to split the bill or he asks or, you know, he doesn't immediately pay. Mm -hmm. Would that be an ick for you? Would that turn you off them? That would be a huge ick for me yeah isn't that interesting she's a therapist and that's fine but for her and her bubble it would be an ick and i think that's fair as long as you're all dating in the same bubble i wish we could do this is probably too neurodivergent for the world but i really wish we could say like hey what's the bubble expectation because like i just do that and people think it's really interesting but i just want to know ahead of time like what am i paying for what's the expectation of behavior but even for her, it would be an ick. Yes. Yeah. It, so even for you, it would be? Yes. But everyone's different. Here's the thing. I would say for a lot of people, it'll be an ick. For other people, they would have no issue with it at all. Different bubbles, different expectation of behavior. I love, I love Graham. I feel like he's probably had this conversation so many times he's annoyed by it now. He seems a little like, I'm so over this. And that's just a part of dating. Yep. For some people, the icks are other people's green flags yep and, and vice versa some people's green flags are other people's x and dating yes exactly exactly this idea that there's an objective this idea that like oh my god like this happened this happened dating advice is so specific to culture it's so specific to the bubble it's so specific to how you've lived your life thing is all about just finding someone who you mesh well with who you want to spend time with and that's a great way to even it out. Now, I, I do tend to agree. I, I think, you know, on a first date, I, I think the guy should treat, but I don't think it always has to be that way. Mm -hmm. And if you're not that person, that's totally fine. And there's going to be someone out there who doesn't mind or someone out there who you could split an appetizer with. It's a good one. The reality is, it's kind of like I remember that that old Chris Rock joke in the first three months of a relationship. You're not you. You're the ambassador of you. <laughs> so which I hate. That's the part that I hate about socializing. It feels like consistent like that. It feels so fake and performative and it feels like a lie. And I'm like, I'd rather just be me. And if you don't like it, let's fucking not do this. But yeah, there's this idea of performative, like performance. You're the ambassador of you for three months. You're trying to like, no, only if you're settling. Like, I think if you're settling, 
then you're playing some sort of hierarchical game on like how to find the best mate in the game. You're competing against others. I'm not competing against others. My partner and I weren't in competition with anyone else. We were looking for our soulmates. We were looking for that person that we were so compatible with. There is no competition. There is no competition when you're with somebody who's fucking so compatible with you. It's like you don't even have to think about it. Like we're not talking about the same things, which is fine. I'm not saying my way is better or your way is worse. I'm saying like we are not talking about the same things. Sometimes I'll get feedback from people where they really want me to sort of validate their relationship. And they're like, my relationship is the same as yours. And I'm like, the affection and love you have in your relationship is not my place to say. But we're obviously doing different things, right? And it's fine. And I'm not saying yours is worse. I'm saying that that's not what I'm doing. And I think that's the problem people run into. If you need to compare your relationship to other people's, and you need to like get it validated by other people, I don't think you're really in the relationship you're, you think you're in. Or maybe you are, but it shouldn't have to do with other people. It should be you and that consciousness you are bonding with who knows like, oh, we're really doing this thing, huh? We really found the thing. And I learned this from my parents because my mom and dad really have this mentality of it's like they're the team and everybody else comes second because like they are truly like the team. And they will live together and die together and everybody else will move away and have their own teams, which is true. Like that's very, very true, you know, and a mixture of what I think is a soulmate is literally just on the resume, like in terms of values, it's it's like 80 um, percent or more. It's like really, really good. And then va va voom, the sexy, the romantic, the affectionate, all of that is compatible. It's such high compatibility that the probability feels so magical. We call it a soulmate. That's what I think of a soulmate romantically. And then platonic soulmates, kind of sim similarly, when you have a best friend, I have so many, so many of my inner circle, my best friends, they are like my soulmates to me. I love them so much. We're just so compatible in so many ways, but we are still very different. We're not doing life together. I love, I love my platonic soulmates, but I'm not doing life with you, right? I'm doing life with my teammate. They're not my teammates. They are like a different version of connection and intimacy in the universe. But it's just because like we get along so well, we're interested in similar things. We want to talk in a certain way. We have like, they stand out to me as people. But I don't want to do life with my best friends. I want to do life with my partner or myself, right? Um, let's see. What not says, so then what's the difference then from knowing that you're completely compatible with this instead of lust or like attachment issues? Well, it's about knowing yourself. First and foremost, knowing if somebody is your compatible soulmate or your ideal partner, whatever words you like to use in your bubble, is knowing yourself. You have to know yourself to know the person. Because again, if you don't know yourself, anyone who talks the right game, anyone who's slightly nice to you could be the perfect person and is not the perfect person. And eventually that leads to and contributes to the divorce rate, right? We're talking about values and morals. Lust has no correlation to real partnerhood. I do not lust for my partner. I'm attracted to my partner, but I don't have lust. When I think of lust, I think of casual, momentary, physical, absolutely strictly physical attraction to somebody. I don't have lust for my husband in that sense. I am very attracted to my husband and I'm very sexually aroused by my husband, that has nothing to do with what I think lust is. The reason lust is a sin in religious communities is because it's temporary, superficial, and completely about your like wanton needs. So again, if you're asking me what's the difference from like lust and falling in love with somebody, well, first you gotta define lust. Because again, the definition I grew up with is lust is a sin. Lust, yeah, it's fleeting. Sophie says it's fleeting. It's fleeting. That's why people who say, oh, well, if I'm not going to have sex in my marriage, I'm going to have to cheat. You're talking about lust. A woman who's going to wipe your butt when you get Alzheimer's doesn't care how tall you are. A man who's going to stay with you through, you know, months and months of chemo is not going to care if you're sucking his dick during chemo. A person who loves you, who is there to have companionship with you, 
actually live a life with you, honor your consciousness, and you're going to honor theirs. It's symbiotic. They're not going to care about fucking lust. So if you notice that you're focusing on lust, it's probably lust. And I've lusted after many of people, okay? It's fleeting. It comes and it goes. It's just a moment in time, right? You know? Raven says, hopefully this doesn't come across as judgmental, but what happens if you and your partner break up? So you mean my husband if we got divorced? I mean, obviously that'd be devastating. The only reason we would get divorced is over abuse. So we believe divorce is justified in abuse situations. It's justified in any situation. Like genuinely get fucking divorced for whatever reason. I don't give a fuck. Your life is yours. I'm not here to fucking judge it. But genuinely, if you're looking to get divorced for any old reason, that's not your soulmate anyways. The way I have searched for this man my whole life, the way that I hoped I would run into him or or her, but had accepted I might not. You think I'm just going to leave this person because they throw socks on the floor? You think I'm going to leave this person because we stopped having sex when we turned 50? You think I'm not going to do life with this person because they got Alzheimer's? If you're willing to get divorced over casual stuff that was never your soulmate, if you're willing to cheat on that person like you're you're not their soulmate. You're not you do not love that person in the fundamental deep way that I am talking about. Right? So if we get divorced, it will be because there was abuse that happened and that will be devastatingly sad. Because obviously both him and I are doing everything in our power to never abuse each other, accidentally or on purpose. That is something we make a conscientious effort to always pay attention to, right? SB says, do you think getting a crush on someone else in a relationship is because you're missing something in the relationship? Mm, It's difficult because I'm not quite sure that I experience crushes, so it's hard for me. But um, if you talk about a crush as an attraction to another person and a hyper focus onto them and sort of a thinking about them and dreaming about them, I do think that something occurs that allowed you to even open that door that probably is not a reflection of the relationship, but your relationship to the relationship. Again, I put all the responsibility on the consciousness, right? I put all of the responsibility on the consciousness. You know what I mean? So if you're crushing on somebody else, I mean, maybe that's normal for you. Okay, let me say it like this. It depends on your brain. Because my husband and I have talked about that. Like, do you think we could ever crush on other people? For him and I to even be interested in somebody else, there has to be a part of our brain that opens up and actually like talks to that person. And we're very antisocial. Like we do not talk to people. We talk to our friends. But the intimacy, the vulnerability that I would need to crush on someone, I wouldn't even think to talk to somebody in that capacity now. So how other people have crushes, I don't know how that works. Do you have a crush from a mi- like a mile away? Do you have to talk to somebody first? Like so many, I, have, I would have so many questions if somebody came to me and said, I'm married, but I'm crushing on someone else. I'm like, how the fuck did that happen? Because I literally could not crush on someone unless I got to know them intimately. And I'm married, so why am I talking to anybody else intimately? Like, and I don't mean just like intimately generally. I mean intimately specifically, you know? Um, Bro, are soulmates even real? I don't believe in magical soulmates. I don't believe in magic. I don't believe in like woo-woo stuff. I use the words, but I don't believe in them. What I mean by soulmate is literally compatibility, like probability, like numbers, like math. This human being plus a million more, I think there are a million compatible people with me. And I ran into this one. I ran into him first. In 33 years, he was the first of those million that I ran into. And so even if I meet another one of those million, I'm not going to engage with them in any way to even probably know they were one of them because it would, again, that intimacy, that vulnerable conversation probably wouldn't even occur, right? Because it's very specific, so again, like I, I don't know because of how my brain works, how much that is relatable to other people's. But obviously, I don't think like we're literally magically connected. It feels that way, but obviously it's not true. I think 
if I was to ground myself, we are just sexually attracted to each other, which is good for partnership. And we are compatible in terms of values. And we really, really, really like each other. We feel like best friends. It feels like I get to wake up every day with the coolest person to, to, to just talk to and spend my time with and vice versa. We just feel so compatible, you know? And I think that's like how I view it personally, you know? Question, can you find your soulmate at like age 19 or 17 or 18? I think it's not a matter of age. It's a matter of probability. And I think fully my partner and I both on our own journeys had already decided that there wasn't maybe a chance of us not meeting somebody that compatible with us. And so we decided to sort of like radically accept that, which I think ultimately made our relationship so much healthier because by the time we met each other, we were like, oh, cool. We weren't sure if we were going to run into each other. And look, we did. Right. That's pretty cool. But like we were fully prepared not to which is why we already had our life figured out. We were doing things. And we had our own jobs and our own apartments. And we were like figuring out our lives as if we would never find that person, which is what makes my partner compatible with me. Ironically enough, I would not have been compatible with somebody that was really, really desperate to find their soulmate because I think it's icky. It's an ick for me in the same way it's an ick for this therapist, for a man not to pay for dinner. It's an ick for me for someone to be desperate to find their soulmate. It signals like a dependency I don't like in a person. I need to know that when I die, your whole life's not going to go upside down. I don't think it's romantic that your life is ruined over my death. And I need to know that when I die, you radically accept that like that could happen at any moment. Yes, I'd be devastated. Yes, I've already cried now over the idea of like, oh my God, we're going to die one day and I'm going to miss you so much. But also my life will not be ruined over your death. Because I think my soulmate would want me to be the healthiest and most functional person. And I think some people's partners want them to be ruined over them dying. And I think that that's not my vibe, personally. You know what I mean? Now, my brother found his soulmate wife at 2221. They are genuinely, obviously, soulmates. I could not have picked a better person. He could, like, he obviously had had so many dating probabilities. He met so many women. And he finally met this woman. And it's so clear to me they're soulmates. So he met his at 22 and I met mine at 33. Everybody has a different trajectory. Everybody has a different thing. But he knew himself so well. And he's only gotten stronger and better as, as a man, as a person, as he's aged. You know, they're pregnant with their fifth. Everything's looking great. Their house is here. They, you know, they're living their best life. You know, blah, 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 blah right? So it's not about age, but it is about knowing yourself and it is about being healthy and it is about all these things, right? <laughs> My brother's in the chat, Mark. I, he knows, he has seen me date some of the shittiest people. He has seen me so unhappy, my little bro, right? That, you know, it's so different now. Like I obviously found the human I'm supposed to be with. But also, I had to become the person that was right for that person too. We, we both had to meet each other at the right time, right? Otherwise, we just wouldn't have been each other's person. If he didn't do the work on his own before he met me, I wouldn't have been attracted to him. If I didn't do the work before he met me, he wouldn't have been attracted to me. And all of my 20s was me figuring out like, is this what I want? Is this what I want? Is this what I want? When really I should have been asking like, who are you? And why do you keep picking these partners? It wasn't until I figured out who I was that I could even think to invite the right person into my sphere. And I want a healthy partner. I think that's also a huge thing because I think a lot of people are willing to settle for an unhealthy partner because the codependency feels romantic. You know, you want to impress somebody. You're, you're trying to show interest in somebody. I think you could do that showing your personality because then it just doesn't feel like you're uh... – you know, trying to throw money at the at the problem and try to wow people. If if anything, I think it could work against you because it seems mm -hmm. like you're trying too hard. You're investing too much. You're showing a little too much too soon, trying to wow the other person instead of 
enjoying the moment and showcasing who you are as a person. I don't think you have to spend a lot of money to be able to do that. There are plenty of places you can go to happy hour. Just, just meet slightly earlier, get the happy hour pricing, it's gonna be like half off. And then find cool places to walk around your location. Just simple things that are free. Window shopping is free. You're so, there's so many free things out there that if you're just a good time, people will wanna be around you uh, without having to spend a whole bunch of money. Like Think about like your best friend. You guys could just go and hang out, uh, spend no money, and still have a great time. Like that's how it should be. Mm. The friend because you look at your partner as your best friend. A lot of these people don't look at their partners as their best friends. A lot of these people aren't looking at their partners like their best friends. They're looking at them as this like prize or this thing that's like makes the brand look good. So when you come from a specific bubble. They're not thinking we want to be best friends with our husbands or wives. You know, that's a very specific bubble. The bubble that says, oh, my husband's my best friend. That's a very specific bubble. And even so, oh, my God, I watched Papa Gut do a TikTok. My husband and I were watching it. We're like, oh, look, it's Papa Gut. We were like on TikTok and his TikTok came up. And he was talking about whether or not it would be weird if your wife or girlfriend went to lunch with their coworkers. And Papa Gut's like, no, like, why would you be going? Or yes, it would be weird. Like, why are you going out to lunch with your male coworkers? And I wouldn't go out with my female coworkers. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And he comes from a different bubble where his, his partner is his best friend and they are each other's best friend, but they don't seem, I could be wrong. They don't seem to have opposite sex friends in the same way versus my partner and I, like, it would be weird if he and I didn't have opposite sex friends and friends in, ge in general. So obviously like he's not going to think it's weird if I go out to lunch with a friend who happens to be a boy and I'm not going to think it's weird if he goes out with a girl who happens to be a friend who's a girl or whatever. Like I would never even think about it because him and I don't care about gender. We don't care about anything. We don't like we don't care about what pronouns like we don't care about gender. We're not thinking about our lives like as gender. We're not like thinking oh my god we're just we're just connecting with people who happen to be men or women or non-binary people. Like we're not even thinking about it. But when you're in a bubble that really, really thinks about it, yeah, like if my farm brother had a female friend he was getting lunch with once a week, I'd be like, what are you doing? That's not appropriate because gender is important to them. If gender is not important to you, do you really think like all the non-binary people aren't going out to dinner with people because they don't, like it wouldn't even make sense in a queer non-binary bubble. Like it wouldn't even make sense to even care about gender and whose friends have or what gender. Like I, I, I cannot tell you how this would not make even, a, it just wouldn't make any fucking sense for that to matter. But of course, if you're in a bubble where it matters, then it's different in the fresh and fit bubble. It matters if you're a man or a woman because Myron has often said, do not confide in your women, confide in your bros. Isn't that interesting? So he doesn't even think of his wife as a best friend. He thinks of her as a trophy for the brand. Not that Myron has a wife, but you know. Mark says, you make me feel like I'm not behind in life for being unexpectedly lost in my identity again at 25. Nah, it's a bro. How many times you watch me reinvent myself, bro? How many times you watch me? Look at your siblings. Look at the mess of the siblings and look at the good of the siblings and realize like it's all a journey. How many of us have to change and figure ourselves out a thousand billion times? And everyone's journey is going to be different. Friends who you need to go and like, you know, wine and dine and do all these things with to have a good time. Maybe that's just because they're not that interesting. She oh. went out with this guy and they went to a cafe and they got uh, coffees and he uh, asked her to split it. Coffee. <laughs> Can you Venmo me 250? Thank you. And she said and she was having so much fun on the date until the bill came. And she was shocked. First, she thought, I must, he must really, really have had a horrible time with me to have want to not pay for my $5 coffee. <laughs> and then he asked her out again. And she said to me, I don't understand this at all. So he was interested in me and he didn't pay for my coffee. And she did not go out with him again. <laughs> mm. Okay. Coffee is interesting. Uh, even going out to lunch or going out to whatever, like, look, nobody has cash nowadays. So if you're both going up to the register and you're both ordering at the same time, whoever wants to pay can pay. If you're ordering at different times, then you each pay for your own thing. 
But it is interesting, this idea of like, how much could that have been? $5? But also, do you guys know that meme? Uh, you know, Randy, who makes $15 an hour, getting everyone's bill at the end of the night for $200. Uh, Steve, who makes $200,000 an hour, asking you to Venmo him $250 back for the coffee. Do you guys know that meme? Sometimes there is a bubble of person that's like so frugal and so down to the penny and so into the money that they are very much like, hey, can you vend me back for the 250? And a part of me is like, maybe I should be more like that. But my Middle Eastern, like my Middle Eastern background won't let me. The idea that I wouldn't offer to pay for $5 is so crazy to me. But at the same time, I also see those, oh my God, have you guys, have you seen those TikToks of friends that like will go out to dinner and then they'll be like, you invited me out to lunch. You have to pay. And I'm like, whoa, if I say, hey, do you want to go get lunch with me? That doesn't mean I'm going to pay unless I say I'll pay. And assuming that your friend's going to pay for you at lunch and then ordering everything on the menu. Oh, my God. Like I would dump those friends in a second, bro. And so I think about that all the time. I see these TikToks all the time of people that are fighting over bills or saying like, hey, your man has to pay for our bill because like that's what a man does. No, that's what I mean. I'm telling you that gender is playing a huge problem in this like miscommunication because there's so much expectation of like you're a man, so you should pay. Look, if the man wants to pay, the man wants to pay. But also, how do you go out with friends? How do you go out with friends And expect them to pay just because they said you want to go out to lunch with me. That's crazy. You know? That's crazy to me. Rookie mistake. Come on. If it's five bucks, do I could see if the bill were 500. And maybe they got carried away. Maybe he got. Okay, wait. Ingrid says my friends and I always split because that's what's fair. Okay. I don't think splitting is fair. Do you guys, do you miss? Okay. If someone says we'll split the bill, it means we'll each pay 50-50. Why would we pay 50-50 when like you're ordering more than me or I'm ordering more than you? Like I remember when I was at my poorest, I was on a very strict diet. I'm not diet, budget. And I would go out with my friends and I would spend like $3 right? Three bucks, but like some chips and salsa, some three bucks. And my friends would spend 20, 30, 40, 50. Why would I split the bill for people if I know like I'm on a very strict budget? Now, I know some people are like, I don't want to go out with friends who are on a strict budget. But as long as the friends don't bring down the mood, what do you care if people are only buying $3 worth of food as long as they pay their own way? You know what I mean? So splitting isn't usually fair to me because it means 50-50. But I say pay for what you ordered and that's it. I say separate bills. I'm going to go further. Separate bills. You know what I mean? And then if you're on a date, negotiate before you go on the date who's paying. You know? So I don't I don't know what you guys mean by splitting the bill, but like that never comes out fair to me. Goes. Plus, I tip differently than other people too. I tip 20%. Between 15 and 20, but mostly 20%. So I don't like people being like, oh, I'll get the tip. And then they tip like 10%. I'm like, you're only tipping 10%, bro. I'll get, then I've had that happen. Oh my God. I had it happen once where the guy, um, I dated a guy who wouldn't tip, who like refused to tip. And we went out to a restaurant in Hawaii. We were visiting his family. And I threw a $20 bill on the table to pay the tip. And he picked a fight with me for like three days. He was like, I can't believe you just did that. I was like, well, we went out to a restaurant. It was four of us. And I put a $20 bill on the table. Like I wanted to give at least like the right amount of tip. And he was like, that's so fucked up. You know, I don't like tipping. I was like, yeah, but that's like your values. I used to date people with completely different values than me. And it was the worst mistake I ever made in my life. That's why I say like soulmate compatible is like 80% or more. Like my partner and I are probably at like 99% right now. Right. But like, I don't mind tipping. But bro, you know what I mean? Like I, I can't believe I dated somebody like that. Oh, gross. Anyways, um, Ingrid says, I thought splitting the bill meant paying for what you ordered. It could mean that in your bubble, but in my bubble, it doesn't mean that. If you guys say split the bill, it could mean that. Um, But it depends because I know if you tell the table, like, can you split the bill? They'll ask evenly or what for what you guys ordered. 
But if I hear someone say, we'll split the bill, usually they mean like 50-50. But I think you could technically say, oh, can you split the bill? Which could mean, um, it depends. I guess I, it just totally depends on the bubble, right? Right? It just depends. And he orders the appetizer, the $20 entree. And she goes and she gets the steak and the lobster and the champagne and all the appetizers mm -hmm. to go. And the bill's 500 bucks. Maybe at that point, you split it. You split, but for a $5 coffee, that just seems incredibly short-sighted, especially if you actually have the intention of seeing them again. That one... Um, it's hard because when other people are paying, the reason I also, okay, the reason I also don't like other people paying is because I want to order food without freaking out about the cost. Because I, I think that's what's a struggle. Like, look, when I went on my first date with one of the guys I dated to the pink door in Seattle and it was a $400 bill, I was happy to pay that bill because I really wanted to go to this restaurant. But I could see that being like kind of threatening or insulting to people or like I don't want to be that girl who goes on a, on a friend date or on a date date and my friend's like, oh, I'll pay for you. And then I am like, yeah, but I'm going to order a lot of food. So like I don't want you to have to pay for that. And if they're like, okay, how about this? I'll pay for like half of it. It's like, okay, that's fine. But also I can just pay my own bills. I'm like an adult. You know, one of the best parts about being grown is like you can pay your own bills. You know? But also, that's also something you you earn over time, right? I couldn't pay for the same kind of bills in my early 20s as I could pay for now, right? I wasn't eating the same kind of food. Balto says, this reminds me of the 48 Oyster Girl. Remember that? Yeah. Do you guys remember the girl who ordered like 48 Oysters on a first date? It's like, don't be rude. Like, don't be rude. You know what? You don't want to be rude to the people offering you generosity, but also you might want to say to them, is it okay that I like pay my own way so like I can order whatever food I want? Is that okay? You know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to insult you, but I want to be able to do this. You know? I just don't think it was worth it. That was a, a bad choice. Do you agree with that decision that she made? 100%. <laughs> and I, I mean, I didn't say that as, as her therapist. It's really about yeah. understanding it for her. What if it's a test? What if the guy's like, hey, I got. I don't like tests. I don't like tests because tests are lies. So let's listen to Graham's example of a test and how we feel about it. A hundred million dollars in the bank. I'm going to I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to spoil her. She could live in lavish riches all the time and fly first class. But she's got to be cool on that first date to go and split a five dollar coffee. If she's that type of that type of girl, she's my type of girl. What if it was a test? You know, I've heard these stories. Uh, on like Reddit and stuff like this. I have no idea if they're true. Where guys like really, really, really wealthy people would rent a place that looks more like normal. They drive a normal car, have like a little tiny apartment somewhere and they start dating. And they take that date to like the small apartment. They drive them around in the, in the cheap car. And then if they pass the test for a few months and they're like, hey, actually, not my apartment. Well, it is kind of, but I got this $30 million mansion. And uh, yeah, this car, usually I'm driven around in a Rolls Royce or I take my Pagani out. And it's like, a, you know, but, but they pass, they pass the test. So <laughs> maybe that was this and she missed out. I don't know. Okay. I think that in some situations it could make sense, but also how do you test somebody without lying to them? That's the question. How do you test somebody without lying? So I personally, I don't call it testing, but I, I'm okay if you do. I just say like, pay attention to behavior. If you're not, like now, I know not to date somebody who doesn't tip. Now I know to date, like I pay attention to how you treat dogs or how you treat people who need help. Or I'm, I'm trying to look for your character. I'm trying to like judge your character. I'm not, and I want to know why you did it. Did you do it? Um, because you want people to think you're a good person, red flag. If you did it because like that's just a part of your value system, green flag. You know what I mean? So I don't know how to test somebody without lying to them. And I don't want to be lied to. I really hate being lied to. And that's probably my like, mm, I don't know, extensive justice or something. So like how do you do it without lying to somebody? And then again, depending if you're long-term dating or short-term dating, if you're courting someone, it's different. Now, don't get me wrong. Absolutely, people will try to put their, quote, fake foot forward. Usually in some bubbles, they call it putting your best foot forward. I would argue it's your fake foot forward. 
and they will overplay their ability to perform or be. And so when you actually start dating them, they transform on you and it's like, oh my God, who did I even marry? Well, you married the performance version of them. And I think that's so cruel, but I think it's how some bubbles operate. There is a bubble that asks you to perform and put your best foot forward, which often is a lie because it's not your best foot. It's the version of you that you think that person wants. And then when you marry them, they end up changing on you because they secured the date. They secured the person. And then it becomes like, oh, my God, who the fuck did I marry? Part 52. You know? I just like want to know who you are, dude. And if we're compatible, great. And if we're not, then why the F would we do this much paperwork for nothing? The person came around and a couple times and said, are you ready? And the guy said, oh, no, we're not ready yet. And then at a certain point, he said to her, oh, do you want to put your credit card down, right, to her? And so she just said, I could never go out with somebody like that, even though they had a really good time before that. You know what? Here's my thought on this, okay? If you're going on a date with a guy, okay, take your card out and offer to split or offer to pay. That's it. I would say probably nine times out of ten, the guy will say, no, don't worry about it. But he'll appreciate the offer. It's an offer. But you got to be prepared to also accept. Yeah, you gotta be you gotta be open to accepting it. You can't fake offer. You can't have fifty dollars in your bank account and you pretend you're offering. That if he's like, all right, yeah, just do that. You gotta be prepared to go for it. This isn't like you know a chess move where you're trying to. Right, you're not trying to manipulate your dates, you fucking sociopaths. Like, listen to the dating world. The dating world is so psychopathic. It's like, how do I convince my partner to basically pay all the bills so I don't have to? And I'm like, you're crazy. All of you are insane. And you're sitting here pretending you're what's normal. If you're what's normal, the world is unhealthy, which, by the way, it is, right? It's crazy to be playing 4D chess that hard. If you're just trying to get a free meal out of something, be a sex worker, you fucking bums. Get a sugar daddy to pay your bills and put out. Like, you know what I mean? But that's another thing I look for. Are you just trying to get a free meal out of somebody? You know what I mean? Like you're assessing someone's character. And I do think like being entitled, right? <laughs> sprinkle, sprinkle in the chat, sprinkle, sprinkle. Being entitled is a disgusting, I hate, I hate entitlement. I just think it's gross. But also, it's my personal ick. Maybe it's not an ick for you. Some people like the entitled attitude. Like, I ah, gotcha. You gotta well, they like the facade of the entitled attitude, which is like faux confidence. And so they think like, oh, my God, they're just really asking for what they want. And instead of seeing it as like what it is, entitlement, they think it's confidence. Be prepared to actually go and do it. But just taking the card out, just offering i think would would go a long way maybe in this case just just her offering to uh yes but is it part of her personality is offering to pay actually a part of her personality because i want to date somebody who like gets it who like it's a it's a part of them and they agree and it makes sense to them and everyone does everything different like trust tests and making sure we're not taking advantage of each other and making sure we respect each other it's like the people that are like women in middle of sex will revoke consent. It's like, what am I supposed to do? And I don't know what you're imagining. I really don't know what you're imagining. But it usually goes like, oh, hey, I'm getting a headache. Can we stop? And it's like, yeah, of course. You roll over, you stop having sex. Maybe you jerk off. Maybe you don't. But you turn on some anime and you keep going with your life. But I don't know what some people are imagining, but it's the entitlement thinking that this sex is about me coming and not about us having a moment. And if you don't care about your partner and their health and their joy, then yeah, you're going to feel like every date you go into, every sexual encounter you go into, every friendship you go into is a way to play 4D chess with somebody else's feelings. And if that's a part of your personality type, I think it shows bad character. Personally, I think it shows bad character to go into any type of relationship with somebody and think you have to play 4D chess which is why I don't like friendships or I won't consent to friendships or parts of friendships where people are like, can you read my mind? Can you guess that I'm upset? Am I allowed to be passive aggressive and slam the dishes until you notice I'm pouting? No, you can't. I know why you're doing it. I know I've done it in the past. 
I am we're not going to slam dishes and be pouty so we could so people can guess why we're upset. We're going to come out and bluntly say I'm upset and I would like to discuss it. We are not going to do that because it shows bad character. It shows poor character. If these are people you care about, why are you abusing them? If these are people you don't care about, why are you leading them on? To get it might have, you know, disarmed him a little bit. You know, I'm not saying to play tricks or anything like that. But you know what? I'd say for a lot of guys, it's, it's just a nice gesture. It's the thought that counts. Mm. Most people will never expect it. It's just like, okay, you offered. Cool. That's it. And then maybe you just got to do that once or twice. You know, like you pretend to put your card down. And by the way, if somebody asked you out to a very expensive restaurant, let's say you wanted a Michelin star chef, it was going to be $800. You can just say like, oh, I don't have the money for that right now. Like my husband and I, they're, we want to go to a Michelin star restaurant maybe. We want to do like exciting eating around Europe. We want to like do these exciting things. We're just going to save up for it. Whether it takes us five years or 10 years or 20 years or maybe two months, it's, it's a matter of us saying – We'll have that experience when we can pay for it, which is the responsible thing to do. But I think people shame you. I think when you're young, you're like, fuck it, I only live once, which I totally understand. I've been there. But I think ultimately there's like a shaming thing where it's like, oh, you can't afford to go out to dinner. I want to go to Nobu. You can't afford to go out with me to L.A. Like it's just like all of this exhausting stuff that happens, all of this exhausting performative thing that happens. If you don't have the money, I know it feels bad, but genuinely that's because it's about priority. Hey, I wish I had the money, but no, I can't justify this cost. And by the way, there is the difference between saying I don't have the money and I refuse to spend the money on that. I dated a person, not binary person, and they made over six figures easily. And I asked them once if they would come to an event with me that was $35. And they were like, I don't want to go to that event. I don't want to spend $35 on something that like I don't think is worth my money. And I was like, oh, Oh, yeah, it hurt my feelings a little bit because I wanted to go with them. But at the same time, OK, like I, I got that. Like that makes sense to me. It's not about not having the money. It's just they didn't want to spend the money on it. And I think that's really responsible because I think some people would have felt pressure to spend the money. Did you hear about this? Talk about pressure to spend the money. Have you guys heard about I can't believe you all are still doing this. Can I be real with you? I cannot believe in this economy, you guys are still doing baby showers or wedding showers. I cannot believe in this economy, you are doing housewarming gifts. I'm going to be real with you. You must be fucking crazy. You must be rich as fuck. I cannot believe you are asking middle class or poor people to give you gifts for your baby showers. I just, I'm shocked by all of your behavior. Have you seen how expensive eggs are and you are asking people to spend money? That's outrageous. I'm offended. I cannot. This isn't the 90s. We're not living in a surplus economy. This isn't the 2000s. This is this is this is 2024, girl. I cannot believe y'all are asking your bridesmaids to still pay for their own dresses. $400, $200, $500, $600. I cannot believe y'all are still inviting people to your destination weddings. I cannot believe y'all are still putting that pressure on your family and friends. That is shocking to me. Like I girl, in this economy, the amount of people I know who have spent $800, $600, $700 on being bridesmaids. Look, even as a little girl, I knew this was fucked up. Even as a kid, I was like, I can't believe because I was in a couple of weddings. I was like, I can't believe we have to pay for our own dresses. What the fuck? What are we doing here? I can't believe in this economy, you are asking people to spend money on your day. You all are fucking entitled, bro. This isn't the fucking 90s. People aren't rich anymore. It's crazy, bro. That's crazy, bruh. Uh-oh, Cassandra says, literally just threw my sister a baby shower and I also spent most of m most of money, my money, of most of the money just on the planning. Mm -mm. I didn't want to say no because I knew she wanted it so bad, but damn, mm -mm. no, no. I mean, I get it. And hell, if we all had money, for sure. But like, we out here starving, okay? Like, girl, we out here just trying to pay rent. I, pfft, no. It's, it, I know people get offended too. Like, you don't want to be my maid of honor. You don't want to be in my wedding. Like, what do you mean? And it's like, girl, do you even understand what you're asking of people? You're asking a lot of your friends and family. That's what I'm saying. It's like people don't even think about how they're 
inconveniencing other people. Now, I will say this, though. Some people do do destination weddings, so people actually don't show up, but they send gifts. And I think that's interesting. And I still think that's shitty. I do. I just think it's bad. It's bad behavior. You know what I mean? But that's me. That's my morals and values. I don't know. Everyone is different. Everyone is different. Everyone can do their thing. I don't care. But if you're going to go out of the way to even show up to my wedding, I feel like I should pay for my wedding. And if you want to give a little bit of a gift, great. But like I'm inviting you to go out of your way to celebrate me. It feels weird. Now in Arabic like culture and Arab culture, not Arabic culture, Arab culture, usually you spend a lot of money on the wedding and everyone is supposed to pay for themselves and more. So that's a customary thing, which I think is fair. But like I had a small little wedding. We had a couple of friends show up. We paid for people's dinners. It felt weird to ask people to go out of their way to come to our little person weddings, like five, six of us together. Like why wouldn't I pay for the stuff? You know, it just felt so strange. You know what I mean? Like not to do that, you know? But again, everyone has their own values. Everyone has their own thing. I'm not here to like, I don't want to stress people out just because I want to have a party. You know what I mean? Same thing with like when you want to go out to eat, but like, you know, your friends can't afford it. Either offer to pay or go by yourself. And the guy will be like, no, nah, don't worry about it. She'll be like, no, no, really, really. And the guy's like, no, no, don't worry about it. And then you're good. You know, one down and then it's like, oh, no, then you're good. That's it. That is my advice. Also, it probably helps that these are people who also tend to get lunch or pay for things when we're together. And that's the other thing, too, is like I do tend to have friends where we like everyone tends to pay at different times. Yeah, I guess like if I really thought about it, I my friends are pretty good people. I tend to be around people that eventually get the bill. Yeah. So with that said, you guys, thank you so much for watching. Let me know. Okay, okay, we're done here. Okay, now, I was watching that and I was thinking, oh, Graham's like probably done having this conversation. Guys, how do you all say you're in charge of your lives? How are you all going to be out here talking about how you should have, you know, the right to speak up and advocate for yourself when you can't even pay for dinner or not pay for dinner? Can you imagine how much we give ourselves credit for, which is reasonable, but then we fumble the ball when it comes to like who pays for dinner it's like we got to start asking ourselves why do we feel this pressure it's probably from your bubble and again this is the mistake I made this is the one way it can go badly sometimes when you try to be so outside of the expectation of behavior you put up with really bad behavior so let me give you the downside so the upside, of course, is you get to live the life you want. You get to do it with people that agree with you and the life is awesome. What if you end up with someone that's a piece of shit, though, and they go, well, this is just how I live my life. This is how I want to live my life. You're like, yeah, that's cool. You're like living life how you want. But the way they choose to, quote, live their life is going to bring you headaches and toxicity, like the ex-boyfriend that didn't tip. We never got to go out to great restaurants together because like he refused to tip and I refused to go to restaurants where we didn't tip because I wanted the dining experience. So he was the kind of boyfriend that loved going out to places you didn't have to tip. And that was fun. But I like a sit down restaurant myself. And I was like, I want to go out. I want to like have fun and pay a waiter and tip them and like have an experience. And he's like, well, I'm not going to be there and I'm not going to put up with you tipping. I dated somebody. This is when I was like 24, 22. 22, 24, 24, 23, 24. I think it was about 24. This is a time in my life when I was dating somebody who was 12 years older, by the way, literally so much older, who cock blocked my happiness and how I wanted to do things because I chose to date a person whose own version of happiness cock blocked my own by nature. We weren't symbiotic. We were not in symbiosis. We were not vibing. So yes, we can radically accept that's their bubble. That's how they want to live their life. That's how they feel in charge. I don't want to be a part of it. And that's got to be a good enough reason because I got to be able to enjoy my restaurants. I got to be enjoy able to enjoy my tipping. I got to be able to enjoy my life, right? And so there's something about that that I think you trap yourself. You got to be careful. The difference between knowing when to like radically accept that everyone's going to live their life and that has nothing to do with you and then knowing not to date those people, even if you accept that that's how they do their life. I accept that Fresh and Fit have their own bubble and their own way of dating, and that's how they do things. I don't need to date them. And I still can hold the value of like, I think it's toxic, but you do you. I don't know. I don't make
Texas, I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Done.